In this video, we'll be looking at Gunfire Games' sequel to Remnant from the Ashes, Remnant 2. Remnant is a third-person roguelike shooter-looter with RPG elements. Just like the first game, there are large open areas which are pretty lore-rich, with plenty of world-building and lots of dungeons to explore. The bosses were, again, pretty punishing. Now these games are RNG, random number generator, which means that my playthrough could have gone a lot different to yours, meaning that whilst you faced this boss here, I may have faced this boss instead. Due to that, we'll explore the basic outline of the plot and then look at the different worlds and the basic lore around those worlds. But please be aware this video is more to explore the storyline and it's not going to be a full deep dive into the story behind every single region, boss and NPC character. If you do want that kind of thing, then I would suggest checking out QuickTab's channel. He does a great job of explaining different lore around different worlds and NPCs. Finally, please be aware that there will be spoilers for Remnant from the Ashes. It's DLC, Subject 2923, and of course, Remnant 2 as well. With all that being said, let's begin. It's the 20th of June 1968, and the world has effectively ended, but some small groups of survivors remain. The world itself has been destroyed by something called the Root. The Root is essentially a race from another world that invaded Earth with the purpose of killing the last surviving members of humankind. But how did this happen? Well, before the invasion, scientists on Earth, along with the military, discovered ancient writings and something that would eventually come to be called the World Stone. The writings themselves were somewhat deciphered, and they spoke of ways to be able to connect humans to the World Stone. Research was extensively carried out inside wards, bunker-type structures that were likely initially built for the coming of a potential war. The connections to other worlds would allow these human subjects, called Dreamers, to be able to virtually visit and go to these other worlds, which of course had their own world stones. The scientist overseeing this project was a man called Dr. Yurik Harsgaard, who was working out of Ward 16. Harsgaard was put in charge as he possessed a strange ability to be able to understand the runic writings. You see, all other worlds except for Earth have what is known as a Guardian, and these Dreamers would connect to the Guardian. One Dreamer, a subject called Gabriel, was connected to a Guardian which was the size of a planet, and this Guardian was worshipped by the inhabitants of that particular world. That was until they turned on the Guardian. It was here that the scientists realised that if the Guardian is killed while the Dreamer is connected, then the Dreamer will die as well. After Gabriel's death, the scientists attempted to connect another Dreamer to the same world, and found it overcome by the Root, who were hunting and killing all of the world's inhabitants. It was then discovered that a world without a Guardian makes that world extremely susceptible to Root invasion. Another Dreamer, a Dreamer known as Subject 2409, ended up connecting to… well, nothing at all. Little did they know that the Dreamer had actually been connected directly into the Root itself, and to a being called Clawbone. This connection would serve as a way for the Root to invade Earth, and within a couple of years, most of humankind was wiped out. This brings us into the game Kronos Before the Ashes. A century after the initial Root invasion, a young adventurer who was armed with a sword and a shield set out to find and put a stop to the Root, to slay the dragon in the tower, and to save humanity. The young adventurer spoke with a tree and was instructed to kill three guardians. These guardians were the Guardian Cyclops, the Guardian of the Pan in Yesha, the God of Many Faces, and a Guardian of a place called the Labyrinth. Turns out that the dragon, which had been imprisoned by the Guardians, had tricked the young adventurer into becoming the new gateway for the route to remain on Earth. This then leads into Remnant from the Ashes, which takes place a month after the young adventurer failed in their quest. Another adventurer would set out to try and find out what happened to the young adventurer and to slay the dragon themselves. The adventurer, the Wanderer, gets caught in a storm though and their boat crashes. The Wanderer comes across a man fighting off the route outside of Ward 13. The Wanderer tries to help the man but the man is killed, and the Wanderer is quickly about to be overwhelmed. Some survivors from Ward 13 come to their aid though, and they meet the commander of Ward 13, Ellen Ford. She tells the Wanderer of her grandfather Andrew the Founder Ford, who had spent years researching and trying to stop the route, until his sudden disappearance. The Wanderer then sets out to try and find Founder Ford. Their journey takes them to many different worlds by use of the World Stone. The Wanderer eventually finds Founder Ford in the world of Yesha, where he had been imprisoned. Founder Ford informs the Wanderer of Ward 17, which is inside a tower which, itself, is the location of 2409, the Dreamer that connected directly to the Root. 
The Wanderer eventually realises that the Dreamer and the Gateway is now the young adventurer that had set out a month earlier. The Dreamer pulls the Wanderer into their world to fight a root manifestation known as Nightmare. After defeating Nightmare, the tower collapsed, and having escaped, the Wanderer leaves and returns back to Ward 13 again with their quest complete. But it's not over, as the roots still exist on Earth, and this leads us into the Remnant DLC Subject 2923. One year later, the Wanderer visited Ward Prime, an old laboratory which is home to two realms, the Earthly Realm and another realm where hostile root enemies exist. The Wanderer learns that Harsgard wasn't just head of the Dreamer program, but he became obsessed with sharing a connection with Clawbone. His obsession claimed the lives of more Dreamers, as these Dreamers became unstable and driven to madness, leading to them attacking scientists. The facility was then abandoned. At the centre of Ward Prime, though, was a portal which leads to a world called Rysum, a world of strange creatures and giants. There, the Wanderer meets a young woman named Clementine, who is subject 2923, and she possesses a unique ability to destroy root infestations. She has formed a strong bond between herself and the Guardian of Rysum, which brought Clementine to their world so she could help them defeat the root attackers. The root, however, attacks Rysum again, and the Guardian passes its power to Clementine. Clementine realises that Earth is essentially a nexus, so it needs to be saved from the root, otherwise the root can use it as a gateway to all other worlds, so she reluctantly returns toward Prime with the Wanderer, so they can put an end to the root. Shifting to the alternate realm, Clementine creates a new portal which leads to somewhere different. Inside the portal, the Wanderer comes face to face with Harsgard, who has now merged with the Root and has taken a grotesque form. The Wanderer defeats Harsgard, which cuts the Root's or claw bones ties to Earth. Clementine and the Wanderer return to Ward 13 to a warm welcome. But again, more is to be done, and this leads us into Remnant 2. 20 years have passed since the Root's connection to Earth was severed. Two travellers, one the game's protagonist along with their friend Cass, are exploring the barren destroyed streets in search of a ward. Cass is suffering from what is known as Root Rot, and it's spreading. It's treatable, but she needs to have it seen too soon. As they move on, they talk about how they hope the people in the ward have items to trade, otherwise the pair will not last long in the wild. Passing through a small warehouse, or what's left of it, they find the damage by the Root and its growths still there. There are also root creatures left behind as well, creatures Cass refers to as a deadwood. Eventually they're forced underground where they find a nest, along with more root creatures. The traveller is impaled by a root creature and is gravely injured. They're about to be surrounded, but they are aided by a Ward 13 survivor, Bo, who is the ward's mayor, along with Clementine who, it appears, had settled in Ward 13. Bo uses a healing item known as a Dragonheart to restore the traveller to full health again. They follow their two saviours, and after making their way out of the sewers and fighting more root creatures, including a tough root mantis variant, they will make it to a safe area where Cass starts having a coughing fit, clearly struggling with her root rot. Cass is taken to Ward 13 where she can hopefully recover. It appears that since the Wanderer helped banish and sever the root from Earth 20 years prior, it's safe enough now for the survivors of Ward 13 to live outside again. In the meantime, while Cass recovers, the protagonist speaks with and meets people from the ward. On the way to meet Founder Ford, the traveller overhears a heated conversation between Founder Ford and Clementine. The two clearly don't get on. At all. Speaking with Ford, whom the traveller figures is now over a hundred years old, it's revealed that his daughter, Commander Ellen Ford, has passed away. Also, Ford needs the traveller's help, and tells him to meet him by the gate to Ward 13. In truth, Andrew Ford is immortal. He gained this immortality through the use of the World Stone. After getting tooled up, the Traveller meets Ford at the gate and they enter the Ward 13. The place is exactly as it was left. Then they see the World Stone again. It's dormant, it's been shut down after the death of Dr. Harsgard, but Ford uses the nearby terminal in a strange cube and it comes glowing back to life. Ford reminisces about the journeys that the World Stone gave him and tells the Traveller to tell Bo to seal the door and to bury the place in a tomb of concrete. Ford then touches the World Stone and gets pulled into some other world. Clementine shows up and after the system announces that the core has been compromised, Clementine is pulled into the stone by something. The Traveller tries to prevent it from happening, but to no avail. The Traveller then attempts to go after her, being pulled into the stone themselves. Okay, so what happens next is completely randomised, as the Traveller can be pulled into one of three different worlds, but I'll start with the world that I visited first, Yesha. 
You might recognize the name, Yesha is the only world to have appeared in every single Remnant game, even Kronos before the Ashes. It is home to a race of goat-like bipeds called the Pan. A lot of the lore for Yesha was established in the previous game, but Yesha was once a lush vibrant green landscape with beautiful trees and lots of plant life. It was home to at least two demigods by the name of Mirdri and her sister Kaula. The Pan societal hierarchy consists of Pan nobility, including the priests named the Lemir, who buried the dead, and Pan commoners who tended to live among the treetops. The young adventurer went there 20 years earlier and defeated the guardian of the Pan, the Pan Guardian, opening the world up to invasion by the Root. Now, when the Traveller arrived, the situation regarding the Root is a lot worse. Over the years, the Root had slowly taken over. Even the demigods were not safe, as the demigod Kayula was taken by the Root and corrupted. Again, the RNG plays a part here, as the Traveller is taken through one of two possible scenarios. When the Traveller arrives in Yesha, they arrive at a site called the Red Throne. The Red Throne is essentially the seat of power of the Pan civilization, and it is sat upon by the Eternal Empress. Reaching the throne room, the Traveller speaks with the Empress's assistant. The Pan are themselves mostly intolerant of anyone not of their race, and they harbour ill will towards any outsiders. They refer to the Traveller as Paxaltec, which is a term for someone not of the Pan, and they claim to know what the Traveller's goal is. The Empress's assistant speaks of the Empress's immortality, and speaks of bringing something sacred to the Pan called the Nunya Tav back to the Eternal Court after they were cast into the Abyss by the Root, so that the Deserved can obtain immortality. The assistant mentions an abomination, a corrupted guardian which bedevils the Empress. They want the Traveller to kill the Abomination, and then they will help them with their goal. It turns out that after the young adventurer killed the Pan Guardian all those years ago, its rotting remains were overtaken by the Root. It's making a mockery of divinity, so that's the driving force behind them wanting it killed. By doing so, they claim that it will bring peace and greatness back to Yesha again. Now, a little bit more is revealed if the Traveller decides to decline the Empress's request to kill the Abomination for her. The Traveller fights the four Pan warriors protecting the Empress, and if they lose, they will get thrown into a prison where they will be held captive. At this point, the Empress will reveal that she is not the Empress at all. The Assistant is the real Empress. The Empress's immortality is fading away due to the root corruption of the Pan's sacred and mythical Thane tree. She is therefore hiding her identity. Anyway, should the Traveller agree to the Empress's request, the Traveller will leave the throne room and will eventually come across a Pan musician, the Flautist. He stops playing and tells the Wanderer about the God of Many Faces, and mentions its demise at the hands of the other Paxaltec, who of course was the young adventurer. He then sends the Traveller in the right direction in order to kill it. The Traveller, after fighting their way through an area called the Widow's Court, reaches the mythical Thine Tree, indeed heavily corrupted by the Root. The deceased Pan Guardian is there, heavily corrupted and influenced by the Root, by way of an entity called Corruptor. The Corruptor is effectively controlling the possessed Pan Guardian. Despite its aggressive nature, the Traveller defeats the Corruptor, and obtains something called a Segment, something that all powerful beasts hold. In the alternate storyline, when the Traveller arrives in Yesha, they immediately come into contact with a Pan called Battle of the Vaunt. This particular Pan leader is horrifically afflicted with Root Rot, and is covered in fungal growths. According to Bedel of the Vaughn, he was attacked a while ago, and it started out as a small wound, but then whatever afflicted him just grew. He thinks that the root, which Bedel calls the pestilence, is keeping him alive, but he doesn't know for what exactly. So the Vaughn's had a duty to something known as the balance. It's revealed that Yesha is a world that really needs balance, and a big part of that balance is due to something called the Wolf and the Red Doe. The Wolf, a spiritual being, is referred to as the Ravager, who Bedel refers to as the Plague of the Pan and the Defiler of the Doe. You see, the Doe kept the Wolf, the Ravager, in check, but has not been seen for a long time. That balance was completely destroyed when the Root invaded Yesha. The Root creatures now outnumber the Pan themselves, which, my guess, fits with the goals of the Root, to eradicate all life forms. The Ravager was overcome by the Root, and according to Bedel, has pledged fealty to the Root. The reason for this was that after the Wanderer defeated the Ravager in combat 20 years prior, after being left for dead, the Ravager swore allegiance to the Root in exchange for saving its life. You can guess what's coming. Yep, the Traveller needs to kill the Ravager. So the Traveller makes their way to the Lost Temple, deep into the jungle of Yesha. They come across a water harp, constructed by Pan Luthiers, who are makers of musical instruments. The harp was built in order to soothe the creature, which was killing a lot of the Pan populace. After playing the song, the bridge extended. 
Inside the temple, the traveler finds the Ravager's lair. The last of your kind left me for dead. That is when they found me and offered me their enlightenment. Blind was I until they opened my eye to the lies of permanence. Oh, the feeble empress craves her fruit, tries to guzzle immortality. But all things die, come, even gods. Theirs is a mastery of death, the all that is nothing. And so I offer the choice they offered, come. Return to the ash from which we all came. Or break the yoke of balance and become eternal. But the bridge between ego and soul cannot be crossed without paying a toll. Here bleeds the lie. Here mules the old order. Kill it. Kill the doll, and we shall seal our pact. The traveler has a choice here to kill the doe as requested, or to heal it, causing it to run off. During the first storyline, if the Traveller was imprisoned by the Empress, the Empress's assistant reveals that after the Pan Guardian's spirit is freed from the Corruptor, the Pan belief is that that spirit will use the Red Doe as the vessel. But anyway, there are two other variants here but they don't matter too much, they just affect what reward you receive after the fight. Returning to the World Stone again, the Traveller is transported to yet another world. The Labyrinth is essentially an ever-changing bridge between different worlds. The founder Ford himself would use the labyrinth to travel between worlds in his attempt to explore. No one really lives there, but nonetheless, it did once have a guardian. Of course, this guardian was taken down and defeated by the young adventurer. Although the guardian was defeated, there were still remnants of said guardian which defended the labyrinth against the root. Their efforts were in vain though, as after the death of the guardian, the root used the labyrinth as a way to travel to and to invade other worlds. This led to an entity known as the Keeper returning to the Labyrinth. I say returning as the Keeper is actually the one responsible for the Labyrinth. The Keeper's return did come too late as aberrations had started to occur in the Labyrinth causing it to crumble. The Traveller, after travelling through the crumbling Labyrinth, meets the Keeper, who seems to be a very large eye entity. Clementine is there too. The Keeper sees the Traveller as a hostile threat and attempts to attack, but Clementine stops it. It's clear that the Keeper was the one that pulled Clementine into the World Stone. The Traveller pulls out the segment that they acquired from the previous world, and the Keeper takes an interest in it. The Keeper refers to the segment as a failsafe. You see, the Labyrinth exists, but what also exists above that is a core. The core is in danger of being corrupted by the Root. The segment itself is part of something called the Index, which can purge the Root corruption. The Keeper needs the Traveller to acquire more segments by killing more powerful beings, two of them in fact. The Keeper then refers to Clementine as the Utility. The Keeper gives the Traveller a biome, a special key which will open doors or portals to other worlds. Upon further conversation, the Keeper explains that Clementine bears the nature of both the Core and of Guardians. Speaking to Clementine, she basically says, thanks for coming to save me, but I'm staying. So the Traveller leaves through one of the two portals. Alright, so Nerud is essentially a massive construct, a ship the size of a planet which is capable of interdimensional travel. This ship was home to a race called the Drazir, a race which had survived for an entire millennia. The Drazir were themselves made up of different classes if you like, Seekers, Astropaths, the Zul, the Fetir and the Ophildi, with the latter being basically the bottom rung of society, yet very crucial to the efficient operation of the Drazir's goals. As a race, they were extremely technologically advanced and they had used this technology and biology itself in order to achieve their goals and to learn a vast amount about time and space. But, and there's always a but, they could not even after 20,000 years of searching, no matter how hard they tried, find any trace of life in the universe other than their own. 
Then, the Drusir discovered something called the Seat of Creation, which was basically the center of the universe, and inside it, a supermassive black hole which was named Ellipsis Tora. Given that the Drusir were hell-bent on fixated on finding the meaning for life and creation in general, they theorized that all the answers to their questions lay within the black hole of Ellipsis Tora. But there was, let's say, a split in opinion. A foul smell shimmers on the horizon of time. The, the ambit ember will show me more, but it will take time. Thankfully, those who would face Alepsis Tora are a minority. The Drazir have always trusted the intuition of the astropaths. That is why we exist. The Drazir will not alter course now. A being called the Custodian, essentially a super advanced AI, believed that Nerud could survive the journey into the black hole, whereas another Drazir, being Talratha, known as an astropath, basically the person or entity guarding the Drazir, whilst excited about what they discovered, tried to warn the Drazir against this plan, saying that Nerud would not be able to survive its journey. But the Custodian's plan was the chosen approach. The Drazir had faith in their technology, and this technology was used to manufacture stasis pods for the Drazir. These pods were supposed to protect them from the effects of the black hole. I say supposed because it didn't go well. Talratha, the custodian, and a tiny number of Drazir were pretty much the only survivors, and the rest of the Drazir transformed into zombie-like entities who were doomed to amble around the derelict construct they once called home. Essentially, time passes a little differently inside the black hole itself. Nerud was in the black hole for 100 years, except when the Drazir exited the black hole, billions of years had actually passed outside of it. When the Drazir entered the black hole, the rest of the universe died a heat death. There's more to it, but we'll cover the smaller details as we go along. But let's dive into the storylines as again, there are two randomly generated storylines on the Rood. The Traveller enters into an area on the Rood called Seeker's Rest. There they find an item called a Seeker's Key. Its purpose is not yet clear, but the Traveller thinks that it seems important. A little further into Seeker's Rest, the Traveller encounters a huge mechanical floating eye. The aforementioned custodian, the AI, speaks to the Traveller and tells him to head outside and to look for his tower, a tower with a glowing white light at the top. Heading outside, the whole planet and ship is a barren wasteland. A strange fog-like mist covers large parts of the planet ship, which when walked into by the Traveller causes them to vomit. Nonetheless, the Traveller spots the tower in the distance and heads across the wasteland, avoiding various battle drones. Despite stiff opposition, the Traveller reaches the tower and speaks with the Custodian, or rather the Custodian's avatar. The Custodian basically explains what happened in regard to Nerud, why everyone is pretty much dead, and about Alepsis Tora. Of course, the Custodian is super excited to meet another life form. Anyway, the Custodian needs the Traveller's help, naturally. He wants to save Nerud and the Drazir, and to do that, he needs full control of the functions of the ship. It appears that the Custodian wants to have another crack at Alepsis Tora, so to speak. He wants to re-attempt entry back into the black hole. Despite this being a terrible idea, three keys are needed. Seeker's keys, which open up a large door, which is a path to the core of the ship. Control of the core was taken away from the custodian by the Seekers, and they hid away their keys. Of course, you'll remember that the Traveller has already picked one of the keys up, so more are required. The Traveller goes either to a place called the Hatchery, or to the place called the Putrid Domain, and fights one of two bosses and gets the key. It's here that the Traveller sees the factory which was manufacturing the stasis pods, and also with it, the evidence of the failure of the pods which effectively killed the Drazir inside them. The last key is in a place called Astropath's Respite, and again, after more fighting, the final key is obtained. It's time to go to the Sentinel's Keep. Inside is an entity known as Shahala, the spectral guardian of Nerud. The Traveller does battle with the Phantom and defeats it. The powerful being drops an index segment, and after a conversation where the custodian thanks the Traveller for their help, the Traveller leaves Nerud. In this storyline, instead of arriving on Nerud at the Seeker's Rest, the Traveller arrives via the Forgotten Prison. Instead of speaking to the custodian, the Traveller will speak to a mysterious entity who doesn't show themselves. They ask the Traveller to help the Drazir by obtaining something called Soul Sparks, which are contained within a cylinder. The Traveller goes to a place called the Eon Vault and grabs the Soul Spark cylinder. Inside the cylinder are eggs. Moving and twitching, these eggs prove that some of the Drazir survived and have a chance at life. Meeting with the Custodian, the AI entity asks the Traveller to defeat the aforementioned Talratha. The Custodian believes that Talratha has within him a Shining Essence Echo, which the Custodian needs in order to save the Drazir. Since the Custodian believes that Talratha won't part with the Echo willingly, force must be enacted in order to take it from him. 
Upon returning to the Forgotten Prison, it's revealed that the voice that was speaking to the Traveler earlier on belonged to Talratha himself. The Soul Sparks, give them to me. Lifetimes have I waited. Now I can rest knowing that everything left of my people is preserved for eternity. I have created an ark to preserve what is left of the Drazir. Though all of Nerud will cease, my ark will endure, and these sparks will join the consciousness of the countless others within. is inevitable. The custodian will return the route to Alepsis Tora. It will not emerge a second time. So Talratha wants to use himself as sort of an Ark to preserve the Drazir. He also mentions that he once consumed a substance called Ambit Ember, and this gave him the foresight to see the dangers of entering Alepsis Tora, hence why he tried to save the Drazir. Talratha offers the Traveler immortality by letting Talratha eat them. Yeah, really. Even if the Traveler says yes, a fight will ensue, and the Traveler will fight Talratha, either in his spectral form or his physical one. Killing the Phantom will grant the Traveler a dropped index segment, as well as his shining essence echo which the Custodian wanted. Now, in both storylines, if the Traveler decides to go back and give the Custodian what he wants, then he will drive Nerud straight into the Black Hole. His reason is, of course, that after they went into Alepsis Tora the first time, the time dilation effect meant that the universe had basically ended. There was nothing left. So, there was nothing left for them to do but enter into the black hole again. It's not known what exactly happened to them, but later on, Nerud is no longer visitable, and there's no sign of the Drazir in Alepsis Tora either. Just nothingness. In search of the last remaining segment, the Traveller heads through the final portal in the labyrinth, and this leads them to a world called La Somme. So, La Somme is actually the result of two worlds merging together, but this isn't a union that created order and peace. It in fact did the opposite, creating chaos. Let me explain. Before the merging of the two worlds, there was the world of the Fae and the world of the Dran. But for now, let's look at the Fae. The world of the Fae was ruled by the one true king. Not only was he the king, he was the guardian of the Fae. He came about way before the creation of the Fae themselves. Although they didn't show their faces much, the majority of the Fae seemed to be more reminiscent of orcs, goblins, and fairies. They sported really sharp teeth. They likely hate the way they look, hence why pretty much all of the mirrors in the palace are shattered, and why the Fae adorn themselves in beautiful armour. The one true king would write in his diary that the Fae themselves are not fit to rule. The reason was that they, by their very nature, are volatile beings, built to destroy. He even states that it's his duty to protect the world from the Fae. The powerful winds levelled rocks and trees, lightning turned fields to ash. After the storm, out of the ash, the Fae were born, but their nature was there to see right from the start. They hunted, not out of need, but for sport, and they loved the chase. The king would nurture them and try to teach them to stand, to speak, and to dream, but it didn't really work. The king introduced the Fae to discipline and reward, so the king ruled with an iron fist and would have the Fae live by a strict set of rules, when in reality, the Fae preferred a more chaotic lifestyle. There was prosperity in the kingdom of the Fae, but only for some, the ones who offered praise and fealty to the king. So a plot was hatched to get rid of the one true king. An imposter essentially tricked the Fae council into thinking that the one true king needed to go in order for the Fae to be free, but the council had a rogue member who had their own ambitions of leading the Fae. The Fae itself did have two goddesses, if you will, an entity called Nemue, who is a seer and was the counsellor to the one true king, and the other, the Night Weaver, who was the goddess of sleep. Of course, the king knew that the people around him were plotting. Even his scribe, Laywise, would murder and plot, thinking that the king was none the wiser. And the king decided to keep those he trusted the least nearest to him. The truth is that Numue, the king's counsel, was involved too. She actually crafted the knife that was used to depose the one true king, but as she claims, she was deceived by the imposter king. The reason for crafting such a knife was due to the fact that Due to the laws of magic, mortal weapons could not harm the king. So they deposed the king, but didn't kill him, as he was instead put into a deep sleep that he could not awaken from by the use of the knife, and the assassins was one of the members of the Fae Council. 
The world of the Dran, however, was an elven world. The Dran were at one point like humans. The imposter king then took the throne, and this led to a forced merging of these two worlds. The Dran entered into a hive mind like state, and were easily provoked into a frenzied state. Some of the Dran population were not affected by the merging of the two worlds, but these awoken Dran, as they were called, were seen as troublemakers by the rest of the Dran society and were punished for being outspoken against the chaos and confusion that the merger had caused. Lots of Dran would lose their lives, leading to their children being orphaned and ending up at the orphanage, a refuge run by the Oracle of the Dran. There was also a Dran hunter, aptly named the Huntress, who would turn against her own and hunt the Dran for the Fae. Dran would be taken to the Fae Palace and would be sacrificed. The Fae would sap the life force of the Dran. They literally consumed it. But without the one true king there to rule, the Fae were directionless. The Fae roamed the halls of the castle, and its banquet halls are filled with rotting food. But as we did before, let's jump into the first of the two storylines. The Traveller steps through the portal and arrives at the Beatific Palace. The first thing of note here is a massive ornate door, which requires two reliefs in order to open it. And it seems that there are two reliefs for the same king. Strange. It's not long after a journey through the beautiful hallways that the Traveller finds the first piece of the mural, a golden mask bearing the face of the imposter king, Fei Lin. After fighting through more of the extremely hostile Fei in the basement, the Traveller meets a jester who, after showing off their skull juggling skills, produces a magic quill for the Traveller. This allows the Traveller to fill in the pieces of missing portals and move through gateways into other areas. A little while later, the Traveller can come across the Banquet Hall. There is rotting food everywhere, and a very large person sits at the long table. They state that they are celebrating the coronation of the new king. He mentions what the food is. The flesh of an exotic and recently discovered creature. He is of course referring to the Dran. But the man states two names, Feilin, who we've already obtained the mask for, and another name, Feirin. When questioned in regard to this possible mistake, the large man brushes it off. If the traveller decides to partake in the feast, the food turns out to be irresistible. The traveller also meets and speaks to Numue, who tells the traveller that the imposter king needs to be dealt with, and expresses her regret in what transpired in the deposition of the one true king. Later on, after fighting the dangerous Magister Dulane, the traveller goes through a portal and enters into the Malefic Palace. It's the same palace, but darker. Anyway, the traveller finds the jester again. This time, the jester opens up five portals, and stepping through the correct one will take the traveller to the second mask piece, Feyrin. Returning to the ornate door, the traveller places the two masks into their respective slots and the large door opens. A lever takes the traveller between both versions of the palace. They speak to the imposter king. It turns out that there are two kings, sort of. The merging of the two worlds also caused a split with the imposter king, creating two individuals out of one. The traveller speaks with Fei Lin. They mention that they are looking for powerful beings. Fei Lin claims that there's an imposter that plagues him. He is speaking about Fei Rin, his other half, so to speak. Fei Lin, who claims he's the true ruler of the Fei, he's assuming the traveller doesn't know about the one true king being deposed, he wants Fei Rin dead and offers to compensate the traveller for the deed. Naturally, there's two sides to every story, so the Traveller also goes and speaks to Fei Rin. Fei Rin is pretty rude, but he offers the same thing, compensation for taking out Fei Lin, as he also claims to be the true king. Both of them are powerful beings, so the Traveller can of course choose which one to kill. In my playthrough, I chose to take down Fei Rin because, well, he was just rude. Even after taking the imposter down, looking into the floor reveals the other half of Fei Rin is still alive. I'm not sure what this means in the grand scheme of things and the future of the Fey Realm, but the Traveller has another segment and that brings this storyline to a close. So, who is the imposter? I mean, they theorise that it could have been the King's scribe, Laywise, a man the King describes as his closest confidant, who the King knew wanted to destroy him and take his place. The Traveller can also step through the Labyrinth Portal and end up in the Morrow Parish district of La Somme, which is home to a nearby asylum but the gate is chained shut. Trying to find a way around, the Traveller finds the streets are filled with Dran, who are extremely hostile, but of course, they have been influenced into their frenzy-like rage. After a perilous journey through the sewers of La Somme, home to vicious aberrations such as Bargus the Vile and the Bloat King, the Traveller makes it to the backyard of the Asylum. The Asylum itself is home to Dran of a particular madness. After the merging of the Dran and Fey worlds, it was this that sent the majority of the Dran crazy. 
On a side note, there was a local man by the name of Hudas, who was in charge of the clock tower, but the clock had special powers. One night when the Dran were being attacked by some bandits, Hudas left the clock tower to help build defences, but the clock just stopped, and time stopped with it. Literally. The villagers in La Somme had all the time they needed in order to build their defences. Whoever wrote this letter spoke of beasts or demons attacking the villagers, and they think that the clock is what drew them. So the cog was removed from the clock, and again, time stood still. The cog was then hidden somewhere. Anyway, back to the asylum. The traveller finds out that the asylum staff were experimenting on their Dran subjects. There's a reason that they think these Dran are crazy though. In the notes we just looked at, it spoke of the villagers' militia not being able to see the Fae, which obviously led the villagers that could see the Fae being thrown into the asylum being considered mad. Creatures. I see them everywhere. Not much bigger than a dream, but full of rings and teeth. They feed on that stranger. The others? They see them too. Yeah, they'll fight them off, maybe avoid them while a dram dies at their feet, but then, then they do nothing. Move on like nothing happened at all. There are others. I knew one, but I ain't seen her in weeks. After what happened today, I expect I know what happens to any of us who talk about what we see. Or we know. Patients on the asylum's ward speak of the Nightweaver. A conversation with one particular patient reveals something interesting. One particular patient, Orville, would go up to the top floor and draw pictures, and one day, Orville managed to escape the asylum. On the top floor of the asylum, the traveller can indeed see Orville's drawings. He was trying to draw portals, but eventually he managed to draw one and used it to escape. In the basement of the asylum, which contains padded cells, the traveller speaks with the head doctor, Dr. Morrow, who has been locked up and is crying. She too mentions the Nightweaver, Goddess Nomue's sister, Goddess of Sleep. Well, the Nightweaver, corrupted by the merging of the two worlds, has been causing havoc and has been terrorising the Dran, feeding upon nightmares and fear, as well as the life force of the Dran. Morrow says that she was locked up by the staff after she spoke about seeing the Nightweaver, and that the Nightweaver has been terrorising her while she sleeps. She's been trying to finish a sculpture of the Nightweaver, but none of the ones she did were accurate. Morrow has left carved dolls around the asylum. The Traveller collects three of them and gives them to her. Her hope was that seeing them might spark her memory of what the Nightweaver looked like. The Traveller enters the Doctor's cell, but there was no one inside. She'd been busy though, sculpting the dolls, trying to remember what the Nightweaver looked like. She did it, she did manage to sculpt one accurate to the appearance of the corrupted sleep goddess. The Traveller goes through a portal into the Fey Palace and speaks with Nomue, who tells the Traveller that he's been hunted by the Nightweaver. The Nightweaver was corrupted when the two worlds merged together. In order to hunt her first, the Traveller must collect the heart of one of her most recent victims in order to travel to her realm, in order to kill her. Turns out that the Nightweaver is actually Nomue's sister, once beautiful but now horribly distorted due to the evil that now consumes her. Nomue then sends the Traveller to the Nightweaver's hunting grounds, basically the Dran village, in order to retrieve the heart. This place is chaotic. The situation here along with most other areas of the village is pretty bleak, as it appears the Dran have been slaughtered in large number by the Fae, and the buildings have been set alight. The streets take the Traveller to the Fae Palace again, and they face off against the ever-intimidating Magister Delane. The Traveller interrupts the Nightweaver with one of her victims, and she disappears. This victim was the aforementioned Orville, who ended up in the Fae Palace. The Traveller manages to get Orville's heart and travels back to the asylum. There is a strange web, and the Traveller places the heart onto it. They are then transported to the Nightweaver's realm. The Traveller soon meets the Nightweaver, and after a tough battle, the Nightweaver is taken down, and she drops the final segment needed for the Index. Time to head back to the Labyrinth. Travelling back to the Labyrinth's inner sanctum, the Traveller speaks with the Keeper, who has now revealed his true form. He again reiterates that despite his efforts, the root festered and grew beyond his sight, and has corrupted the core of the labyrinth after the guardian was slain by the young adventurer. Turns out that the keeper purged the labyrinth, expunging realm after realm in the hope that it would restrain the rot, but he was too late. Only now, he says a new solution has been revealed. The keeper merges the three segments together to make the index. The keeper then goes on to state that with the index, two probabilities emerge. First, that the root wins, and the second, well, he doesn't actually mention the second. You see, the root is everywhere, but the Keeper states that it originates from a single source, a single realm. Only when the root spread, the door to that particular realm was closed, even to someone as powerful as the Keeper. 
but with the newly formed Index, the Keeper can subvert their defences, making it possible to purge the corruption, meaning that they can kill the root over time. A conversation with Clementine reveals that she is connected to the Keeper, and they now have a bond. The Traveller steps into what seems to be an alternate version of Earth, a parallel universe if you will. It's very corrupted by the root and is teeming with roots, monsters and creatures. Despite this, the Traveller battles their way through them all and eventually reaches the source at a place called the Blackened Citadel. Some kind of force field is stopping the Traveller from progressing, but Clementine shows up with the Keeper. She says that the Traveller needs to win, or it's the end of everything. Clementine then uses her powers to break the force field, which significantly weakens her. The Traveller then comes face to face with the Source, an entity called Annihilation. The fight switches between a physical world there on Root Earth and a bizarre, digital world. Not only that, but it seems that Annihilation was actually being controlled by what could have been a Dreamer. Despite the strength of the ferocious entity, the Traveller comes out victorious. The entity is not quite dead, but it seems the Keeper is unsure about something. He thinks their efforts are all futile. Again, he mentions the first probability that the root wins or consumes all, but stops short of the second probability again. And we're about to find out why. The Keeper mentions that the corruption is inviolate. This basically means that the root cannot be harmed. The containment isn't really an option. It's time for that second probability, annihilation. Essentially, to eradicate the corruption, the system needs to be restored, to wipe everything and to start over again. The root is just too powerful and will destroy everything. The Keeper is reluctant to carry it out, but Clementine comes up with another option. She grabs a segment from the Keeper and runs toward the root entity. She emits a powerful beam of light from her body, powered by the index segment. Annihilation makes one last stand to try and preserve itself, but to no avail. The effects of what just happened are felt throughout all realms. In War 13, people are disappearing, but not just in War 13, everywhere. The Somme, Yesha, and the Rood. All of these people from all realms are being transferred into Clementine. Not just the lives and memories, but the realms too. And then the Traveller as well. It's making a sort of backup of everything. All that remains in the Black Void is the Index. The Keeper approaches but walks away and then the Index fires up and all the data inside of it comes out. Slowly, piece by piece, the realms, the people in it, are restored as they once were before the Root took hold, including the crumbling labyrinth. The Traveller wakes up in the field and the game then ends. Alright, so pretty mental ending, but the Index is basically a data drive and the Root is a virus. When the Keeper was insinuating that the system needed to be restored, he meant literally that, rebooting the universe and all of existence from scratch, not even knowing whether Earth would even exist in this new reality. What happened instead was that Clementine effectively became a hard drive for all the living souls and that and herself was stored it on the Index. Then the Index spat it out back onto a freshly installed version of the universe, if you will. Essentially what she was doing was backing up all of the data she wanted to keep, erasing the root corruption, making a fresh copy of the universe, unfortunately still with the damage caused by the root, and reinstalled all of that data onto the new universe, effectively restoring everything. Think of it as restoring your computer to the way it was at a previous time and date. Clementine, by doing this, has locked the universe into a sort of time loop, which explains the Traveller's ability to, from a lore standpoint at least, re-roll campaigns in the different worlds. This is also something hinted at by the Oracle of the Dran. She is stitching a quilt which features patches corresponding to the Traveller having dealt with something in Lossom, such as fighting the Nightweaver and helping various people and solving mysteries. She mentions run-throughs and all the patches can't be done on a single run-through, and she sees everything, and this alludes to re-rolling different campaigns again. I guess this somewhat makes sense as to why Root Earth was so corrupted. That was essentially the real Earth, the original core world of the AI simulation they now live in. The Earth free from the Root was actually a digital copy. Conversations with Mudtooth lead to him telling a story where he actually met the Keeper. He was in the Labyrinth at one point. The Remnant world itself appears to be some sort of trans-dimensional multiverse. A patient in the Morrow Asylum talks about everything shifting around them and a change. The core of the labyrinth is literally that, the core universe with extensions of it which make up the world and other realms. Some theories speculate that the labyrinth itself could have been built by some super advanced alien race. 
The Keeper himself could have been one of those aliens, and when the route invaded Earth, the Keeper made a backup of Earth, if you like. He did this in order to quarantine the route on Root Earth, the real Earth, and then transferred everyone and everything to the new Earth. If that makes sense. It is confusing. I'm not sure if I was a fan of the ending, if I'm completely honest, that everything was potentially just a simulation. One thing we know from playing the game is that a few people are actually immortal. Founder Ford was immortal, Clementine was, Bo was, the Wanderer was, and also the Traveller is immortal now too. The whole data backup thing explains how this could be a possibility due to the fact that the World Stone itself was a sort of data point. It's confusing at the moment, but hopefully a DLC will shed more light. The ending left a lot of questions, what with the Traveller waking up in what could be a different world entirely. Again, hopefully a DLC will be coming soon to answer more questions, such as what happened to Founder Ford. But that's it for this video. If you did enjoy this one, then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to support. Leave a comment below with your theories and thoughts, but for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one.